Focus on Benaker. How are you? Fine? Mm -hmm. Could you kindly briefly introduce yourself or will she? Perhaps she is your host, isn't she? Yes. Huh? Okay, Mrs. Uh, Jalal. Is she the host of yes, two of us? <coughs> Do please. <laughs> advisor for Croydon, uh, which is the area where I work. Um, Kanchan Shah is, we worked together. She is the head of the homeschool liaison. And She's the head of what? Head of homeschool liaison. Right, homes right. Homeschool right, liaison. Right, I understand this. Yes. yes. And uh, she worked at my school and we still have a, a link with her. Jay Black is working at the school where I work, and she is the RE teacher there. So they're your colleagues? <coughs> they're, they're, they're all my colleagues, yes. Right. You're most welcome. Would you like to ask any any question or make um, any inquiry? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, what I'm interested in, because I, I teach in a multicultural school, and I find that very valuable, and we gain a lot of experience from having so many children from different faiths. How do you feel about the setting up of separate Islamic schools? children? By the government you mean? Well, f as, either as your, your own <coughs> community schools, but I know you have this attached to You know, as far we are interested only in separate educational institutions for the sake of protecting children from the immoral influences of uh, a society which is becoming progressively more corrupt not for the sake of ideologies. Mm -hmm. Morality is a common cause. So if such schools are uh, introduced with special emphasis on morality, then they cannot be called specifically and exclusively Islamic mm -hmm. because then this, the such schools can also be shared by any member of the society, whatever faith they belong to. So that is my idea of separate institutions, if at all any. That is to say they should be moral institutions for uh, uh, providing an opportunity to such parents who are sensitive to the immorality of the society and who want their children to be in the safe custody of some people whom they can trust be immaterial of their faith. Yes. Then the religious difference becomes immaterial. Yes. Because morality is the common ground of all religions. Mm -hmm. That is what is shared. Unfortunately, the religious leadership highlights the differences in the level of ideologies and doctrines mm -hmm. and forget about the most important part of religion, which is to build a, an honest spiritual base among the common people for, uh, first of all, re learning to respect human values, their responsibilities to the society. Without building such a base, the upper story of ideology cannot be built anyway. It will be just spurious and meaningless. Mm. Right? Have I made myself clear? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my question actually very easily follows yes. uh, from what has just been said. Yes. Um, in my work, I have to particularly uh, deal with teenagers, teenagers, um, Asian pupils, and um, in the last 12 years, the numbers of the Muslim uh, teenagers that I've had to deal with have been the greatest, and in particular girls. And the situation, in some cases, the culture clash is the main reason for all kinds of concerns that either the school has or the parents has. Uh, and a lot of these pupils then do not progress as well um, in their sort of academic side of schools. Um, and I am often asked in to, if you like, to so sort of somehow mediate or compromise or, or find a way around situations which are often extreme where 
uh, some pupils start truanting um, or some pupils run away or some pupils there have been cases where one or two tried to commit suicide and so on and then so my job then is to somehow sort it out between the parents the teachers and the pupils themselves on what I am finding very difficult is how to deal with that particularly in terms of parents because because I strongly believe in homeschool support in the sense that there is a, a lot that has to happen at home for some of these pupils to cope with the sort of things you talked about which is all the influences outside um, and until such a time when we get schools which are based on morality and so on they are going to go to ordinary schools Actually, this and is how big, would you advise me then to, to if you like, uh, particularly the parents' side, how would you like, you think, for uh, me to deal with the yes, parents? Yes, I understand the whole question, but there is more to it than advising you or anyone at your level of people who try to handle the problem with success, despite their limitations. Unless those limitations are particularly brought to focus and the society as a whole is made aware that without a change in the policy of the society, without improving the situation of such social workers who were supported with law, with, with, the, with the law of the land, to be able to improve the, the such complex problems or resolve such comp complex problems, unless it is dis done at that level which I have suggested, I doubt if anything can be really achieved at the low level of implementations. There is something basically wrong with the attitude of modern European societies. It has to be corrected or the problem will never be dealt with properly and successfully. What is wrong is that I don't know whether it's because of some prejudices or whatever it is, they teach the students at the school level at the before they reach the maturity that uh, practically you should you are free to do whatever you you do in pursuit of your personal desires and pleasures. You are answerable to the law, not so strictly at this level, but when you come to age, then you will be answerable to the law of the land only in the areas of laws which are man-made, made by the state. But as far as your moral behavior is concerned, virtually you are free to do it today, to now and you will become absolutely free when you reach the age of maturity, then your parents will has n have no right to interfere with the type of life you want to lead. Now, this is the essence of the problem. It's a very strange and uh, contradictory attitude. As far as the laws made by God are concerned, you can continuously to impress upon them, they are just prejudices or ignorances, igno the ignorance of your parents. They live in an age which has, uh, which is over, which is done with and they are not valid currencies anymore in this age. So, they have no right to impose their views on their children in a free society. So, they are being cruel to you, but you have to go with it as long as you can until you reach the age of mat maturity or majority, then you are free to do whatever you please. Now, this is the general message delivered, if not in so many words, but in essence, everybody knows it here in this society and everywhere in Europe and America. So, they, all, they create a generation gap between the parents and the children right from the beginning and they encourage the what I should say diseased elements of the society 
who are drug addicts or given to social evils even before the age of maturity to who are promiscu promiscuous in their attitude to do whatever they do and if problems arise then the social system of the country whatever it's, it is called they come to the aid of such girls who run away from their houses even before reaching the age of majority they side with them without ever listening to the case of the suffering parents now i know there are two sides to it i know there is a real possibility of some extremely ignorant parents to curse their children to something which is beyond the area of morality which is which runs into the area of their dogmas i accept the right of the society not to permit parents to enforce their dogmas to the children to the new new generation they can of course uh, uh, do it through persuasion and conviction and logic they have the first right of course but if the children do not agree with their belief no measure of coercion should be permitted to the parents to enforce their beliefs on to the new generation there it should end as far as the moral behavior is concerned they are spending the nights outside with hooligans with the riff raff of the society and uh, getting addicted to addicted to drugs and uh, you know relationship which is not at all healthy at that age anyway if then the society protects their canopy of protection over their heads this is a crime and most often this is what is happening here all the cases which have come to my knowledge are of that sort the parents have been kind throughout to their children they do whatever they they have uh, sacrifices sacrifice their own comfort and 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 uh, whatever they possess for the sake of their children i have seen the children of such loving parents when fallen into the uh, trap of the society the people or a group or a, of a people which i have described then they see the children the parents suffer the agony of seeing them slip away and no way can they stop it they suffer the cry but nothing doing constantly these children are uh, supported and encouraged by the social system of your country to continue to have it what are the parents they have no right to interfere in your la private life well that private life is that life of immorality which should be understood as immoral through all vantage points of religions not through islam alone every religion is common in morality so instead instead of drawing a clear cut line between that behavior of a children uh, of children which should fall under the under the uh, sphere of rights of parents to shape and mold and that sphere of children's behavior or life which falls outside the parents sphere of uh, influence except through persuasion this of course i have made myself clear where they have no right to instruct them and discipline them if they don't believe in their parents uh, faith they have no right to restrict their movements to confine them to the children to deprive them of their right of education because you have gone astray on the plea that they have gone astray but if they see the signs of immorality of course they have the right to discipline their own children and take exception to this that uh, behavior which they know is bad for them i have seen such girls go out to the social homes and uh, talk back to their parents you know all right do whatever you can you can't and then most often end up 
in such misery that they lose all their life, the meaning of life and they end up, you know, like uh, crosses here and there to be picked up by one group of children, boys and another group of boys later on and so on and they realize it too late that the protection given by the society was not for their sake but against their interests. So, this is the dilemma which you face. <laughs> right? Yes. Um, I'll ask you something which follows that yes, after please. Joy has. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, within England now, all pupils study a national curriculum. I wondered if you could explain your views on the studying of music for pupils within the schools. Study of fine arts is not prohibited in Islam. But what is prohibited is loss of balance in emphasis. Islam does not promote over much role of music in uh, providing a sense of, say, you know, a peace and pleasure with the help of this, the, the, the music, so that one gets whatever he desires romantically or uh, in whatever manner to create a sense of inward music within him. So the purpose of music in reality is to touch the chords of the music within every man and every woman. If the music succeeds in resonating at that level of vibration then this is perfect music. But if it is achieved through artificial means, then the very purpose of this longing for something is destroyed. Because this, appease, this uh, sense of satisfaction through musical tunes to find uh, a chord with the de one's own hidden desires external vibrations, you know, with the help of external vibrations, will not leave such a person in need of any communion with God and to achieve the ultimate peace, which is eternal, which only comes with your being attuned to the folk of God, not to the folk of a musician. So, this, there is a very profound philosophy involved in Islamic teachings. Islam repeatedly declares that ultimate peace lies not in excitement but in uh, one's vibration of one's soul with the soul of God, what if you can refer to the soul of God. God has made man humans after his image. This is not only a, a Christian uh, observation, but also Islamic observation as much. In fact, this is the observation of all religions. Now, what is that image? That image is defined slightly differently in every religion, but essentially it remains the same. So, that desire for music, what you consider as desire for music, is an inborn urge and an appetite to have contact with that godly, you know, characteristics, divine characteristics, which when become at one with human characteristics, create the ultimate peace. And the purpose of music should be to achieve that peace. Now, the problem is not just uh, a problem of our time. This problem has been confronting mankind right from the times immemorial. The relationship of music, religion and peace of heart and mind. It is always the, the I, should, I should say, never 
in the beginning of any religion, music is implied to achieve this objective. Never. Neither Abraham did it, nor Moses, nor, nor Jesus Christ, nor Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Why not? Why did they ignore the basic necessity and requirement of human nature? But they had, in a different way, they fulfilled that urge, that, that hunger, a bit, uh, the, they appeased that hunger by attuning them to the uh, divine uh, attributes with a sense of reality, not through in imagination alone. When they become, be, they attempted to become compassionate, as God is, they, when, when they attempted to be, to before that level, to become just, as God is, when they attempted to be uh, considerate to others and thoughtful to other people's needs and requirements, when they were capable of following or imitating God, to share the misery of the people he created and for his sake, then it is that you reach that ultimate peace. Then no artificial props of music are really needed, nor such a people have ever sought such props. But when the society degrades into lower orders, Always at that level, music comes, m music begins to enter religious practices, never before. What happened in Sufism, in Islam, what happened in the history of Christianity, you will be surprised to learn that no music was relied upon at the time of, the, of Jesus Christ or at the time of uh, many generations to come. But later on at some stage, it was considered essential to help the, the humans to achieve some nobility in their character by way of finding appeasement to their wishes and desires in a manner that they will not be led away from the main instruction of the religion and they will not begin to seek happiness at the cost of others. It is only to that extent that music became helpful and necessary. Because a man given to music is most often given to himself. He retires to his own inner self and is quite happy with that. So no less problem, no, no, no more problem for the society <laughs> at least. But it is a negative attitude. So such people always withdraw. And that is also the case of all such Sufi or cryptic sects which are born at later stages of religion, which not only permit but promote music, that they become withdrawn from the society. And it is a sort of escapism which you uh, notice in their attitude, which uh, they give a good name you know, they, they call by a better name of uh, returning to your own inner self and delving deeper into your own source of eternal truth and say this and that. And they say we are helped in that attitude by the, by the music. So this is in short or at length, however you treat it, the story of the part of music, or the role of music played in religion. So, when it comes to the society which is secular, where there is no religious uh, complexion to guide the, uh, the attitudes of musicians, but they do it on their own, free to give expression to the, their own uh, visions. Then again, in the beginning, it is always a noble pursuit on their part. It is never uh, detrimental to the society at all. 
such music can be approved, such music can even be promoted. But for the fact that if you are given over to mu any music, even go good or bad, you still are detected, distracted from the path of seeking that peace by communion with God to a path which may be noble, which may be uh, may not be evil, but still would create a sense of independence in you, independence of God, not independence of others. So this is the underlying danger. But leaving that aside, let me come to the issue of the beginning of music in secular societies. You will always find that, uh, I mean, there is no uh, exception to the rule as far as my knowledge of the beginning of music goes, always find that the ma classical masters of music always try to achieve a sense of internal peace and not excitement. Now, even when the music rises to such crescendo as you vibrated, you know, like an earthquake, vibrating you. Yet, the ultimate goal is peace. You are carried on the rise and fall of musical crescendos and depths, but always with a sense of achieving more nobility and achieving or reaching the inner source of goodness within you. So, if you find you know, sudden, you know, eruptions into a sort of, uh, 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 you know, like a volcanic explosion. Sometimes in music you come across this. It is only to warn you against evil when it manifests itself into such things. Never to create the love of this misbehavior. So, the result is you go through the, uh, the classical music and at the end of the day, you find yourself so much at peace with yourself and the society. It's sheer loveliness to live with that, you know, sense which precipitates slowly and gradually without you being able to define it. It pre precipitates and settles down in your heart, in your mind and you live with a sense of pleasure which has no uh, following headache like uh, you know <laughs> the aftermath of over much drinking and over much eating etc. But after a while when the society as a whole begins to become corrupt and sensual and more materialistic then it is not the, it mus the musicians no longer lead the society, they are always led by the society. They always cater for the demands of the society and uh, then they, they are never governed by the noble ideas and, and the noble, uh, you know, the, 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 the nobility within themselves is no longer the guide. What they do is, if the pop music is required by a society which does not need peace, but wants commotion, disruption, you know, and uh, wants to go mad, so that there, there are no rules to be seen, your eyes are befogged to be able to see right from the wrong, then whichever direction you want, you are given a full license by that music to do and go ahead and do it. Such music could never be approved by any sensible religion. This is the dilemma. You should try to understand it. Music as such is not, is not made illegal in Islam anywhere in the Quran, no mention is made. But these principles are very clearly made manifest. So I hope in view of this you have got the answer. <laughs> Please. Right. And my question relates a little bit into the, the question that Kirshen asked earlier. Very often to um, 
Westerners and Europeans, Islam is perceived as being a religion which treats women slightly differently to men. It doesn't yes. quite fit in with modern Correct. Western ideas. Why do you think this misconception has arisen and how can it be yes. corrected? Most of all, this misconception is not, has not arisen. Mm. It has been created with the, with, with the will, with the design by mostly by the Christian priesthood. I have studied the history of uh, Islam versus Christianity. Parts of uh, some age, so in some ages you find it very ugly on both sides. But if you study the history of priesthood in the West against Islam, then you will find that they have always perpetrated cruelties against the true Islamic values. And whenever they find no other escape, they always escape into the area of women's sens sensibilities to their freedom or an attempt to suppress their freedom. So such questions always come up. When I answer, attend the question answer sessions, and very often I detect the hand of a willful design behind it, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, if this happens and that happens, then you raise this question. They think the Western society is already so deeply convinced of the total freedom of women that uh, the moment it comes to that, at least half of the society will lose interest in Islam, however best it is presented. This is the angle from which I am going to answer you. Mm -hmm. You see, the, the basic factors which make it essential for any religion to have two different sets of rules and regulations for men and women is completely ignored. Men are designed differently by nature. Women are designed differently by nature they have to perform certain fun functions which cannot be performed by the other part of the sex. And as such, their specific requirements belonging to this area of their natural differences have to be met with by any divine religion, distinctly from the problems of the other sect in the same area. So, it is only in that much that Islam has different uh, rules, sets of rules and regulations regarding the behavior in men and women. In all other areas of human activity, the Holy Quran repeatedly emphasizes that the rights of the women are equal to the rights of men. And when the Holy Quran says rights of women are equal to the rights of men, it does not uh, condition this statement to the difference I have just suggested. That is the overbearing principle. Repeatedly mentioned in the Quran that there is no difference in the rights of men and women. So, when you see a sort of discrimination against women, it could be number one, a misunderstanding spread by people with ulterior motives. What you view, view is not the correct teaching of the Quran. That is one area where you must be, which you must be guarded against. The second is that you may be misled by the Muslims themselves who are misled in their own turn by their uh, geographical, uh, their, their uh, let, let me see, by the social behavior of their own countries, which are not Islamic behavior or an ignorant behavior of a society which is unlettered and which lives rather in an older age than the age they apparently share with us. It happens in many a case that we think we are contemporaries 
but we are not contemporaries in the sense many columns of humans are far more advanced in time than many other columns who lag behind in the long procession. Some are still living in history. So when such ignorances which are a part of these situations, which are a creation of these situations, play a role in shaping the life of men and women, then it is not religion which is responsible for such differences, if at all they are created. It is the uh, uh, ignorant prejudices. So in many an area, this is also a factor responsible for this false impression. And yet there is another important fa factor which is responsible and uh, which is so unfortunate as far as we are concerned. We are trying to, uh, you know, counter it as best as we can, but it's, it's a very difficult and uneven fight. Mm -hmm. Most of the Muslim states have taken the attitude that being the the custodians of political power, they are also the custodians of religious powers. And as such, they begin to interpret religion and implement it in their states without having any right to do it. Because Islam prohibits uh, coercion in religion in any form. Instead of helping religion, they oppose the opposite pole among the religious scholars who believe that they are the custodians of religion by their own right. So the society is split at these planes. Now, both are false. Both are playing gods. Both try to win the popularity of the people and to deceive the whole society so that they retain whatever power they have retained and uh, they have possessed or they retain the power which they do not have. Either way, this is religion becomes exploited by these mm. ulterior motives. So when the Muslim scholars, Muslim clergy I should say, in Iran, in, in Algeria, in Libya, in other places, Egypt, they think the, uh, that religion can be exploited as a means of rising to political power. They begin to stiffen their demands in, in the name of religion so much that it becomes impossible for the, the political leaders to implement those demands. They say women should be confined to their homes, no education for women they must be handled with, with, with a stiff rod. Uh, they know it, at least deep in their hearts they should know it, that this is no religion at all. Yet they do it with such ferocity, with demands which are so threatening, that the entire world receives the message that this is Islam. And the commoners receive the message that the, their own Muslim rulers are no longer Muslims, in fact. Because these are the dictates of Islam, they do not follow. So to appease them, they also sometimes take measures, not fully, but to some degree, to befool the, befool the public opinion that after all we are Muslims, we are trying to do it, you know. It will take time. So madness rules. <laughs> in both the areas and uh, there is impression received by the rest of the world is that is Islam in action, Islam in, you know, in, in, in operation because the name of the country is a Muslim country. So these are the main problems which have to be understood in depth and uh, then specific questions should be raised regarding the two teachings of the Quran, the two teachings of the Sunnah, regarding uh, uh, about the two teachings of the Sunnah and Quran, regarding any discrimination which people think are, is there between Islamic teachings 
uh, uh, of, of, of impl- uh, applying to men and women. So I think this is a very, uh, this requires a very big answer. Mm-hmm. I have just briefly told you the areas which have to be explored. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I'm going to ask a question following on from Jay's, which has always caused me a lot of uh, heartache, headache, you name it, um, which is to do with um, the difference, and this is a, sounds like a very ordinary question, but to me it's very important, the difference between the way I can identify a Muslim woman and not be able to identify Muslim men. And basically it is because of the way uh, she dresses. I can't understand this question. What do you mean by identify? Well, it seems to me with the, the um, conversations I've had with lots of my Muslim friends yes, yes. about why the women, the women friends, why they cover themselves up so much. Now, uh, the question of so much belongs that is to the me. area of which I have already discussed. Right, right. But without uh, emphasizing the muchness of things, you just remain within the fold of the basic question. Is there any different uh, uh, teachings, of, is there any difference of behavior required by Islamic teachings concerning men and women behavior, women's behavior? If you remain confined to that area, then we will find a common ground. I think that would make a lot of sense as well. Yes, yes. Then we will have a common ground. So if you can, yeah, if you can, because that does make sense. Exactly, that's right. Yeah. Mm. You see, when you look at the history of social degradation and uh, the downward trend of morality, in the free Western societies, you will be surprised to see that it is not a question of Western society against Islam at all. It is a question of Western society against uh, Christian values to begin with. Right from the beginning, you study the history there are two, two things which happened. Number one, there was a parallax between Christian dogma and the Christian Christianity, the true Christianity of Jesus Christ, which crea- we became wider and wider, with the result that it was not Christianity which was responsible for the putting to stake. 5,000 poor British ladies, girls and women in the reign of one single queen. Now, you should not uh, att- uh, uh, address these questions in a uh, cross section of time. It is a, quest- a time old question. It should be considered in totality. So, I am answering you with reference to your faith so that you can understand it better and more sympathetically. Otherwise, if I start with reference to my faith, then you will become defensive throughout. I mean, naturally people do become. And you will find, continue to work for answers to my answers. (laughs) Now, let us start where I began with the beginning of moral degradation. There were two things witnessed at that time when I am talking about a few hundred years ago, when Christianity stiffened its attitude on the on Christian women far more than on Christian men in the name of Christ, while well, they had no right. And as far as the morality of men went, they were least interfered with. So, women were practically turned into their female slaves and with no rights even of possession, no rights of inheritance, no legal rights to own anything. 
they were turned into commodities, but all in the name of Christianity. Now, when the stiff grip of the priest began to loosen and weaken, then a confused rebellion was raised. A confused rebellion in the sense that people then did not try to identify the true Christian values and the false supposed Christian values. Then the society began to rebel against the priesthood and their hold on the society with the result that the freedom which was sought by the society was not always in the right direction. It was an opposite reaction to the stiffness, to the stiff attitude of the church. In every area there was a rebellion, but it was a slow rebellion which took its time, centuries in fact, to reach conclusions. So, despite the fact that Christianity was not rejected openly as far as the Christianity, Christian beliefs are concerned, Christianity lost its value as a valid coin to dictate their lives, to shape their lives. So, what was free for men gradually also beca became free for women. And the life of freedom and promiscuity which you notice today has certainly nothing to do with the life which was admonished by Jesus Christ himself and the life which he lived. See, he said, don't cast you know, corrupt glance on, on any other face, you know, on the face of women when you look at them. I don't remember the exact words, but this is a very beautiful expression used in the New Testament, but emphasis on morality, emphasis on segregation is laid very clearly. Jesus Christ chose his disciples from among men because it were men who could discharge such onerous responsibilities and who could suffer the hostility which uh, was surrounding them from all sides and was turning into persecution, actual persecution whenever it was uh, possible. But he never chose women as his apostles to deliver messages and to try to improve the morality of men. That society during the time of Jesus Christ was divided into two spheres, men's sphere and women's sphere. And free intermixing to the extent that they could meet at any time, anywhere by dating is unthought of, undreamt of in that age which I am talking about. Now, this is the basic philosophy of every religion when it comes to treating the human disposition towards laxness in morality. It is an inbred something in man or woman, um, when I say man I mean both, that uh, once they are given license to move in the area of satiating their inner desires, they never stop at the right line of demarcation. They proceed further and further until no rules, no considerations ever influence their, their, their social behavior and there is a free for all in the name of freedom, while that free for all is not truly a sign of liberty. Now, come to this age, I beg you to revise your attitude and opinion of the so-called freedom of the Western society. Where are women free? Of course, you can see a few MPAs, members of the parliament and so on, and women taking part in uh, economic life. But when did ever Islam prevent women from taking part in social, economic and uh, uh, 
political lives of the people, they have been leading armies. Right at the time of Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu the final founder of Islam, they have been participating actually during the warfare, during the, uh, the, the battles going on. And they have been arresting people. His own wife, Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu wife, led a full army against those who, with whom he, she differed. So, where is that restriction in Islam to prevent women from participating in healthy activities of life, which uh, do not threaten their chastity and do not compromise their weakness in the sense that uh, it is they are permitted to be exploited by more uh, unfortunately wayward men because uh, immorality always begins at both levels in a different way when women in the name of freedom begin to offer their charms regardless of what havoc it can play with the society. Men always fall prey. There is very little in men which can stop them from going beyond the limits. And the only liberty you get is to become more and more corrupt morally, which begins to tell upon your peace itself in time. Your houses are broken the trust between husband and wife is lost, the peace of home is sacrificed on the honor of this so-called liberty. More marriages are broken, more homes are dissatisfied, more satisfaction is sought through artificial means of losing oneself in drugs and so on and so forth. Restlessness becomes the order of the day. And to get some player, you have to behave abnormally, to get some kick of li out of life. No longer drinking is sufficient, so you must get some more, you know, new forms of kicks to add a sort <coughs> of vibration in your otherwise stale life. So the whole direction of human pursuits is from God towards ungodliness and it continues. No homes are left safe, no streets are safe anymore. The townships follow the same trend and you know the moral degradation and you witness it with your own eyes and you can't do anything <coughs> about it because the roots causes, root cause of evil lies deeper elsewhere than you think. What you do is, you go on restricting the uh, legislations and always it happens and you do also, transfer more power to the hands of the police and law enforcing agencies, hoping that in this way the tendency towards crime will be curbed effectively. <coughs> but when the causes are different, when the whole society is given the freedom to do whatever it can with no sense of answerability after death. It is there that the culprit lies. No, dis no divine discipline has a right to shape your lives because in reality no divine authority exists. So the faith although be always becomes hollow in such, among such people at such a stage. They believe in God, but in a non-interfering God. The moment he takes the right to interfere with your life and shape it, there is no God. Forget about him. And it is this in Islam which becomes so unacceptable to a society which has moved to a sort of freedom where they, they, they will not permit any divine or non-divine hand to curb their so-called freedom, but freedom to commit crime ultimately. 
freedom to be more unhappy with the passage of time. So it's a strange, strange par paradox, and you must study this paradox in depth, not only to understand the underlying dyscrasia, but also to try to find a genuine remedy to cure society of such diseases. Islamic injunctions, whatever they are, they are based on human nature. In view of this, you can listen to my views on recorded on cassettes and videos where I have elaborated this issue further. I have not talked just in generalities I have, as I am talking today, but I have discussed this issue with particular problems. And then you will realize, and with reference to the Islamic teaching, then I am sure, I am if not sure, at least I hope you will realize that your fears of Islamic uh, uh, teachings being one-sided in favor of men, over restrictive in the areas of women's liberty will, will be proved wrong. Whatever Islam proposes is for the sake of both men and women without indiscrimination, which is for the ultimate good of the society. Now here in England you can see two types of religious behavior in, in fact, three types of religious behavior among women in Islam. One, and that is the largest majority, section of Muslim women's hair pay no regard to Islamic injunctions. They live a life of freedom as much as any other woman in the world can, and they enjoy the liberties of promiscu promiscuousness to whatever degree they can. And still they call themselves Muslims and they always create a front against uh, the society in the name of Islam in the area of uh, doctrinal differences only. Their practical life is as little influenced by Islamic values as the life of Christian ladies is influenced by the Christian values. So, they are, I, I believe, unfortunately, they make the largest section of women, Muslim women here in the West. There is a small minority of extremists who artificially overemphasize, overemphasize the teachings of segregation to a level where, to which Islam never meant. And you will find them, you know, tightly, sometimes completely covered. And they do not participate in any healthy pursuits of life here, which uh, are healthy in the sense that they are human requirements. So, they create another negative impression on the society. There is a third faction or section which belongs to Ahmadi women in Islam. I welcome you, I in fact invite you to go and visit Ahmadi homes and uh, find out the experiences, uh, share the experiences of Ahmadi ladies who seem to be uh, confined, <coughs> but they are not confined. They are free to do anything because the, so the entire society protects their freedom. Yet when they do it, they do it of choice. Do it of their own choice. Whether they are happy or not, this is a question which you can address yourself when you meet them. My personal conviction based on my study of facts and large contact with such families is that those Ahmadi families which pay regard to Islamic rules of uh, teachings of uh, segregation are far more happy, far happier and contented than those who break these rules and regulations and walk out into the freedom of the unhappy and uh, unsafe world. So, this I think suffice, this should suffice here at this oh, time. I think I have got a lot to think, think about and you. very useful yes. things. Yes. Because the time is over and the, the, 
the in charge of the studio came to indicate that only <laughs> one minute is left and I have taken about three minutes after that. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. I have, I have think got quite a lot to think about. Thank you. Yes. You see, this is a genuine free dialogue which mm. should be promoted. Mm. Yes. Not dogmatic answers, not, mm. Uh, mm. you know, dictatorial expressions. Mm. They don't mean anything in human dialogue. You are free to ask anything and I welcome every question and I am free to answer them as I please to genuinely try to make you understand the crux of the problem. Right. Right? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for coming. <laughs>